Dragon Meat by Robert Don Hughes, published in Dragon Magazine, issue 120, April 1987. This jerk killed a dragon and left it at my doorstep. Sir Percival Flaubert, first son of the local baron, blonde, always smiling, arrogant, you know the type. His father bought him the fastest horses, the flashiest armour. Like I said, a jerk. And he had to slay this four-ton monster in front of my hovel. Why didn't I see it coming? My wife had told me the day before that the neighbourhood serpent had seized a virgin and carried her off to his mountain lair. I was mildly surprised there were any virgins left. Sir Percy wasn't particular. In fact, I've always wondered if that girl didn't set the dumb lizard up just to get Percy to notice her. I didn't take it too seriously. It was late fall, I had a crop to get in, and my cow had died two weeks earlier with the flu. Yes, the flu. But I figured everybody has his problems, right? I would manage. When Sir Percy got the word about the virgin, he charged up the mountain and offered the beast a challenge. Oh, not to fight him there, of course. No, they needed an audience so that young Flaubert could build his knightly reputation. He invited the poor serpent to meet him at the edge of the village. My edge. The dragon didn't catch on what the meeting was for, and the girl playing the damsel in distress to the hilt evidently didn't clarify matters. Dumb lizard never knew what hit him. I'd strapped myself into my ox harness and was pulling my wagon in from the field when I saw the crowd around my hovel. Rather easy to guess what happened. Over here laid a mountain of dead dragon and over there stood Sir Percy beaming at the half-hearted cheers of my fellow peasants and ogling the virgin. I went straight to him. I say, my lord, you've slain a dragon. Sir Percy looked me up and down as if I were what stung considered the foul serpent behind me. Then he turned back to the girl. I tried again. Uh, when do you plan to pick it up? His eyes jerked back to mine, his expression of faint disdain blossoming into a proper sneer. Pick it up? He demanded, with that irritating drop and rise on the last word of his sentence that blue bloods must start teaching their children prenatally. That is a dead beast, peasant. I do not touch dead beasts. I've never been a crusader, but the fact that this carcass loomed in front of my cottage stimulated within me a sudden zeal for the proper disposal of hazardous wastes. Well, somebody's got to get rid of it. It'll stink up the whole region. Young Flaubert smiled superciliously. Of course someone will. You shall. Me? I've done you a favour, varlet. Sir Percy snarled. Now you must do the rest. I hated him calling me a varlet. I wasn't certain what the word itself meant, but I knew exactly what he meant by it. Now wait, I began, but the knight had no more time to chat with a common peasant. He tossed the swooning girl onto his charger and mounted up behind her. What have you ever done for me? I shouted at his back, but the racket of iron-shod hooves drowned out my words. He ignored me. I looked at my wife. She rolled her eyes. I looked at my neighbours, or tried. They were all scampering back to the village, or else back to the fields, but not one scampered anywhere near me. The task of dragon removal had been placed squarely upon my capable shoulders. They believed in me. How do you move a dead dragon? What do you do with it once you've got it to wherever you've moved it to? I've never given such questions any thought before. If asked, I might have suggested that a dead dragon would simply disappear, being a magical beast. At the very least, I figured that other dragons would come to collect the remains of their own and bear them off to some burial ground in the hills. That prompted my next thought. I'll wait, I told my wife. She rolled her eyes again and went into our hovel holding her nose. Two days later, no dragons had come and the stench was awful. Worse than that, everyone seemed to hold me responsible. Friends of a lifetime cursed me as I walked the mud roads of the village. Some kid threw a dirt clod and knocked off my cap. I stomped into my cottage to recount these injustices to my loyal wife. Sluggard, she railed. Lazy oaf, it's been three days and you've not lifted a finger to dispose of that thing. That thing, dear wife, will not be moved by my lifting one finger, I replied with all the logic of the truly defensive. Well, it certainly won't move itself, she snarled back. I know that, I barked. I'm working on it. Work? What work? All you've done is sit in the stinking beast's head and bite your lip. I'm thinking. Yes, well, it's stinking. Perhaps you haven't noticed? She added more sweetly. Oh, indeed, I had. I'd even slept in the doorway that night before in hopes that I'd catch a cold. No luck. Why can't you ever catch a cold when you need it? 
If you don't do something soon, we're going to have to leave the village. No one will talk to us. We're outcasts. We might as well burn the hovel to the ground. And what about our children? How would you like it if... She went on, I think, but I didn't hear the rest. Her words had inspired a splendid plan. I'd burn it. Make an awful stink, of course, but how much worse could it be than what we already smelled? I raced to the fire pit, got a really good flame burning on the end of a stick, and ran out to the side of the dragon. There, I paused triumphantly and then put the thing to the torch. It didn't burn. My wife strolled out the door with a smirk on her face. Dragons breathe the fire, she reminded me. Think they could do that if their hides could burn? I shrugged, then sat down on the dead creature's head and thought some more. That night, I didn't even go inside. I slept on the ground and woke with a wonderful covering of frost on my back. I inhaled with great excitement, but no luck. My sense of smell was marvellously acute. It was a bad day. First, the Baron Steward arrived in the company of two of the old goat's men-at-arms. He kept his distance as he unrolled a long scroll and read a proclamation. Whereas I had willfully neglected my duty to king, country, and the lord of the manor, I was to be fined some exorbitant sum to be extracted daily until such a time as the fetid hulk should be removed, and so on, and so on. All this to a man whose cow was dead. I shrugged, and the steward tamped his nose with a handkerchief and started to ride off. That's when the other contingent of riders arrived, dressed in the livery of the king, no less. A strange little man whose eyes didn't focus got off his horse and walked over to me. He had an odd smile, as if half embarrassed about what he was about to do and half thrilled at being the one permitted to do it. Is this your dragon? he asked. He is now. The words were out of my mouth and gone before I could stop them. And the little man's eyes glowed wickedly. I'd known it from the moment he'd gotten off his horse and it was my own fault for not behaving accordingly. This was a tax man. He scribbled something on a scrap of parchment and handed it to me. What's this? I asked flatly, but I already knew. Property taxes, the little fellow grinned, and he got back onto his horse. How could this be property when the baron has ruled it a public nuisance? We've had no conversations with your baron on this matter. He can rule it whatever he like. You ought to be grateful the beast isn't moving. Why? I asked, not really caring. Transportation tax, the gleeful mouseling cackled. And then he and his entourage departed, leaving me and the steward to stare after him. The steward's last words to me were brief. Whatever you do, he warned, pay us first. Then he too was gone, leaving me to sit on my dragon's head in shock and murmur, fat chance. You see, few things terrify me so much as taxes. The baron's fines I could ignore. I was already so deeply in debt to Flaubert, I'd die before I even got to pay off the interest. But tax evasion was another matter. That could get me arrested, hauled off to the king's court, and impaled on a stake. I got a little desperate then, and wild ideas filled my head. My inner turmoil was evidently not particularly noticeable. On the outside, however, my wife stalked out of the house, propped her hands on her hips, and stared at me. I struggled to be polite. Yes? I inquired. Do you realise we don't have a scrap of food in this house? While you perch there like a plump vulture, the rest of our family is starving. Other men in this village would have... I'm certain, she continued, but I didn't hear her. I was off for the cutting board to fetch a cleaver, then back out the door with it clutched in my fist. My wife's eyes suddenly grew very wide and round, and she backed up against our stinking guest and stood there quivering. What's the matter with you? I asked with exaggerated kindness. Don't you point that thing at me, she gasped, gesturing towards the cleaver. I looked down at it. It doesn't have a point, I observed snidely. We're very accurate when we quarrel. When I looked back up, she disappeared. Odd, I thought, but really preferable. I was about to experiment upon the dragon, and she tended to be squeamish. Going to the far side of the mound of flesh, I pulled back the cleaver and chopped downward. I nearly cut my hand off. The blade bounced off the scales and landed two feet behind me, while I grabbed my vibrating arm and sought to still its shaking. Scales, I reminded myself. Under the scales, I suggested as I picked up the cleaver and tried again. It took a couple of hours, and the wife's cleaver would never be the same, but I did manage to at least pry five of the wicked scales aside and cut myself a slice of dragon. I glanced around guiltily to see if anyone was watching, then tiptoed to the hovel door to see if my mate was back. She wasn't. I danced to the fire pit, stirred the coals to action and added a log, then found a flat black pan and started frying the lavender-coloured meat. I won't describe the smell it made while cooking, except to note that hungry dogs would gag at it. 
I persevered, nose firmly clasped between thumb and forefinger of my free hand. Obviously, the stuff did cook. I had to assume that only the scales were fireproofed. How can you tell when dragon is done? The meat still looked purple when I took it off the fire. I let it cool a minute, then steeled myself and took a bite. All my worst fears were confirmed. The dragon tastes exactly like liver. I ate what I could stomach, reminding myself with a desperate optimism that there are many in this life who actually like liver. I didn't realise it, but that moment was the turning point in my life. I was no longer a peasant. Henceforth, I would be a salesman. One thing saved me. My wife liked it. Oh, I didn't tell her what she was eating, of course. I only lured her back to the hovel with the promise that I'd go to the market in the next village and buy some meat. I kept my promise too. I just bought it from myself. I sold a dozen other chunks as well. None to anybody from our village, of course. In fact, I had to leave rather hurriedly when one of my former friends got wind of a scent that had grown familiar and started spreading nasty rumours. I beat a hasty path home, enjoying the unusual jingle of coins in my pants. When I got to the hovel, I cut a few strips off the carcass and told my dear wife that it was parrot. When she told me she would liked it, I told her what it really was and spent that night back outside on the ground again. The next day, the stewards showed up with a new proclamation. I didn't pay much attention, but my dear lady did. She burst into tears and ran over to grab my arm. They're going to seize our home, she wailed. Non-payment of fines. I stood there with a cleaver in my hand, purple blood all the way up to my shoulder, gazing over the head of my wife at our humble hovel. Let them, I grunted. What? She snapped, all tears vanished. What would they do with it? I asked her. Sell it! I nodded knowingly, then took a long, meaningful whiff of that pungent aroma we'd grown to know so well. Right. Must be hundreds of people who love the fresh air, the view. I patted the dead beast's head. I think I was actually growing fond of it. My wife stared back towards the cottage, a puzzled frown over her face. Hmm. That was all she said, and went inside and left me to my butchering. It was dark work. I'd gotten my fill of hacking on those nasty scales the first day, so I used the area I'd cleaned as an entry point and just cut my way into the dragon. By now there was room to squeeze inside, and I was coming to understand the life of a miner. While I didn't enjoy the work exactly, I didn't mind it either. As far as I was concerned, I mined a vein of pure gold. It needed me a healthy profit the next day, when the market rotated to another town. And the day after that, you might say my fortune was made. That same pushy neighbour who had spotted me before saw me again and had gone up onto someone's car to announce that the lavender stuff that I was selling was dragon meat. He'd intended to warn people away. As it happened... I learned that day that advertising, even negative advertising, sells meat. Now, I've never been a merchant, but I've never been a fool either. The sudden run on my ox cart stimulated my economic imagination. I raised my price, not without some hesitation, of course. Would they laugh in my face? Not so. They just paid through the nose in coin or barter, then ran off to brag to other peasants about how much they'd had to pay to get their chunk of dragon. When I toted up my takings at the end of the day, two things were evident. First, I wouldn't have to drag my ox cart around by my own strength anymore, for I'd made enough cash to buy a new cow. And second, I needed to hire my neighbour. Actually, I didn't hire him. Instead, I told him I'd sponsor him. He could climb into the dragon with me, cut as much meat as he could carry, and sell it for whatever he could get. All he had to do was give me half of his daily take. He jumped at the offer. There are lots of idiots in the world, aren't there? Within three days, I no longer visited the market myself. I was sponsoring 14 distributors, and they were doing all the selling. All the butchering, too. About all I did anymore was to find new peasants so I could tell about the business. Incredible as it seemed, I soon had the gold to pay my taxes, and the baron's fines as well. I didn't, of course. I just had the funds available. And I sold my new cow to one of my distributors. After all, why did I need it? If I had kept it, the Baron would just seize it for non-payment of fines. Let him come take my hovel instead. I suppose it was inevitable. About the time the dragon's carcass was half empty and my distributors had started sponsoring distributors of their own, Sir Percy showed up looking grim. Trouble, my distributors murmured, and they scuttled away into the twilight. I stepped out to face the man who had ruined me, and thereby made me rich. He looked at me scornfully for several minutes, as if expecting me to talk first. I could wait. 
Sure enough, the stench at last got to him. Farlet, I hear you grow wealthy from my dragon. With due respect, my lord, it's not your dragon. It is mine. I killed it. Now that I'll grant, I responded, but of course you declared it a public nuisance and bade me remove it. I'm doing that, my lord. But it's my property, Flaubert roared. I paused thoughtfully, then said, Actually, it's not. You see, the king's tax man has declared it my property, and I'm paying taxes on it. Thus, legally, Flaubert then did what any sensible knight would do. He tried to chop my head off. I did what any sensible peasant would do. I ran and dived into the carcass. Flaubert started in after me, actually getting as far as to push his helmeted head inside. Ah, uh, my lord, I said quietly, I thought you didn't touch dead beasts. Then I gave a little sniff. Just a little one. Enough, however, to remind him of the smell. Sir Percy threw himself backward with a lordly, Ugh! A cry no peasant could even imitate. And then he whined, How can you do that? I smiled, but I doubt he could see it through the gloom. Somebody's got to, I reminded him. I'll get you, peasant. I'll be back in an hour with my guards. Bring them, I yawned. We'll seize your possessions. I'll move anything of value inside here. I'll imprison your wife. I'll move her in here too. I hoped he wouldn't ask how I intended to accomplish that. Given her choice, I figured my dear lady would opt for his dungeon instead of my dragon carcass. Fortunately, he didn't press that point. He went on to other threats. We'll attack! Go ahead if you think you can penetrate this old hide. You forget yourself, Violet. I killed this beast. A lucky blow. You got him in the eye. And if the lizard had happened to blink at that proper moment, your blow would have bounced off and he'd have roasted you for supper. This was true enough, and it made Sir Percival scream with rage. It also gave him a new idea. We'll burn you out. I had to chuckle. I tried that. The scales won't burn. We'll, we'll starve you out. I glanced around. Plenty of food in here, I said nonchalantly, not bothering to mention how I loathed the stuff. I figured I could learn to like it. I'll... I'll... It was evidence poor Percy's imagination had run dry. Before he pieced together the fact that I had, indeed, pierced the dragon's hide and that in all probability he could too, I figured I'd better suggest some ideas of my own. Sir Percival, there's no reason why you can't have a slice of this dragon. Now, let me just tell you about a business that just can't miss. It's all based on the single and viable principle that anyone can get rich if he doesn't mind taking advantage of his friends. And Sir Percy, I need a distributor like you. The way I figure it, this skin will be empty within another two weeks. But there are hosts of dragons out there waiting for an ambitious, shrewd knight like yourself to... And Percival bought it. He now has 106 distributorships in a dozen feudal kingdoms, and I sponsor him. We're diversified. I took the scales and started making flameproof armor and selling it to the knights going out after new meat. The wife and I have built a little mansion near the hovel, but we've kept the old place. Sentimental reasons, you understand. We still have our problems. Some noisy group of picketers keep campaigning to shut our business down, saying there won't be any dragons left for prosperity, as if prosperity should need any. But it's all just talk. Why should the king close me down when he's one of my best distributors? We've done well, I can't complain, and the king and some of the other boys are dropping by this afternoon for a chat. We're talking about going into unicorns. Thank you.